In this section, we're going to look at how to create an induced voltage and if you have a complete circuit, an induced current. Basically what we're doing is we're studying generators. In, a, in the previous unit, we were looking at how you can create mechanical motion out of electrical energy. Okay, so that was motors. So motors take electrical energy and convert it into mechanical energy. And now we're going to take a look at generators, which take mechanical energy and convert it into electrical energy. Now, the most important equation for generators is really Faraday's law. And Faraday's law states that an induced voltage will occur whenever there is a change in a magnetic flux. Where magnetic flux involves magnetic field, area of a loop of wire that's in the magnetic field, and an angle phi, which is the angle between the direction of the area vector and the direction of the magnetic field vector. Um, and just going back to when I said a loop of wire, if you don't have a loop of wire, you can get an induced voltage. But if you have a loop of wire, not only will you get an induced voltage, but you'll also get an electric current. And you'll only get this induced voltage and possibly an induced current if there's a change in the magnetic flux. Okay, so now let's take a look at this in a little bit more detail. Okay, Faraday's law. So, it says if there's an induced voltage, if there is a change in what is called the magnetic flux, per unit of time, okay, so delta phi over delta t. To make this an equation, we introduce a negative sign and the capital letter N, and I'll explain what each one of these mean. Magnetic flux is equal to the magnitude of the magnetic field, strength, multiplied by the magnitude of the area vector, multiplied by the cosine of phi, okay, lowercase phi. Now, what do we mean by, let's start with A. Okay, well, here's a loop of wire, and A is the area of this surface that I'm tracing out here, so approximately pi r squared in this case. This is, and this is a conductor loop. The area vector is simply um, giving this a direction. Okay, so for this surface here, we can say that its direction is like this, and it's perpendicular to the surface. Okay, so when you draw a sketch of that, okay, so that would be the area vector. B is the magnitude, the strength of the field, okay, that pierces this surface. Okay, so for example, if the magnetic field is directed upward, we can see that the magnetic field, B, is piercing that surface. Phi is the angle between the magnetic field direction and the direction of the area vector. Okay, so if you multiply all that out, you'll get what is called the magnetic flux, whose units are the Tesla meter squared. The angle is measured in degrees. Faraday's law states that if there's a change in the magnetic flux, then there'll be an induced voltage. So how can you change the magnetic flux? Well, one of the ways would be to change B. Okay, so if this is our loop of wire here, the field that is piercing the surface would either have to strengthen or weaken. Now, in the magnetic field of the Earth, okay, 
um, I would have to hold it like this. Okay, this arrow here, by the way, is a compass needle, and it's showing me the direction of the magnetic field. I would have to hold it like this, and then I would have to either move this loop of wire up and continue moving it upward, because if I do that, the magnetic field strength weakens the further away I get from the Earth. As soon as I stop, though, there's no more change. So there would no longer be an induced voltage and thus an induced current since we have a closed loop. If I start moving it downward, now the field is increasing, and again, I would get an induced voltage and also an induced current because it's a closed loop. Another way to change the magnetic flux is to change the area. Okay, So I could hold this like this in the magnetic field of the Earth and change the area maybe by doing this. But I would have to constantly go back and forth so that we have a continuous change which would create an induced voltage and also an induced current. If I just did this, now the change is over and no more induced voltage. But as soon as I do this, the change occurs again and I'll get an induced voltage and thus an induced current once again. The, the other thing I can do is change phi. Okay, so if this is my loop of conductor, that's the magnetic field of the Earth. If I just keep on turning it like that, I'm changing phi. That's the angle between the direction of the magnetic field, which is that way, and the direction of the area vector, which is always directed perpendicular to this surface here, which is the surface of a circle, okay, pi r squared. Let's take a look at some practical examples now of each one of these. Okay, this gizmo here is called a shake flashlight. And inside of this, there's a heavy-duty magnet, a neodymium magnet, and a coil of wire. And that coil of wire is connected to a light bulb. Okay, when I shake the flashlight like this, the magnet is moving relative to the coil of wire. Thus, we have a change in B in the coil of wire. And this brings me to that capital letter N that I showed in Faraday's Law. That's nothing more than the number of loops, okay? So for this particular coil, there's probably close to a thousand turns of wire. Okay, so let's see. If you see light there, as long as I shake it, and when I stop shaking it, there should no longer be light because there's no longer a change in the magnetic field. All right, so now there should be no light. Whoops. Well, why is there light yet? That's because a capacitor was being charged up. So when I stop shaking it, now the light is running off the capacitor, and this will eventually dim. Okay. Uh, let's take a look at um, changing the area and changing phi. Now, Changing phi um, is really the way most practical generators work. Okay, so for example, this, this here is a generator. And when I turn the crank like this, what I'm doing is I'm setting up an induced voltage between these two terminals. Now, if I hook this up to something, some electrical device, um, let's see, how about this device here? I have a complete circuit, so now we'll have a current which goes into this device, which um, you'll notice looks just like the device I'm calling a generator. All right? So like I said, when I turn this, I'm causing a change in phi, which means there should be an induced voltage, and since this is a, a loop, okay, you're going to get an induced current which goes into this device. Well, this device so happens to be a motor, what we studied in the last unit. But a motor is nothing more than a generator operating in reverse. Here's another generator operating a useful device. Well, more useful in terms of aesthetics. Okay. Okay, this is the generator. If 
I open this box, uh, what you'll find inside is a bunch of horseshoe magnets and a coil of wire, which is turned when you turn this crank. Next, let's take a look at a way you can change A okay, to generate an electric current. Okay, this is part of the loop of the wire. Okay, the wire runs all the way over there to the meter that I have on top of the overhead projector, and then it comes back over to here. So it's a loop. There's no voltage source, just a loop wire. And what I'm going to do is change the area. And the way I can change the area is by simply holding the loop up like this and then moving down real quickly that changes the surface area of the loop. Remember the magnetic field goes through it like this. Okay, and if you look at that needle over there um, on top of the overhead projector, you'll see that it does move when I change the area. Okay, so let me uh, focus the camera on the meter over there, and I'll repeat the experiment. Okay, watch the needle. I'm going to change the area very quickly. One, two, three. Okay, now I'm going to increase it. Now I'm going to decrease it. Notice we're getting alternating current. What I'm going to do now is demonstrate how you can induce a voltage in a loop of wire, which in turn will induce a current um, as long as it's a closed path by changing phi, that is the angle between the area vector and the magnetic field direction. Again, the magnetic field of the Earth is directed this way. Okay, it runs parallel, pretty much parallel to the room, room's floor. Okay, and here's the loop of wire, and I'm going to rotate it and generate a voltage, which in turn will generate a current and the meter over there on the overhead projector. Um, you'll be able to see the needle going back and forth, indicating that an AC current is being um, created. Okay, here we go. Okay. I don't know if you can see the meter there, but the needle is definitely going back and forth. So we uh, just took a look at how a voltage can be in induced, and this is Faraday's law, and it says that an induced voltage is equal to the negative of n, which is the number of turns, this would be one term, multiplied by the change in the magnetic flux per change in time, where magnetic flux is equal to the magnitude of the magnetic field strength times the magnitude of the area vector times the sine of phi, where phi is the angle between it, the direction of the area vector and the direction of the magnetic field strength. Now, let's talk a bit about what we mean by the negative sign here. What's the purpose of the negative sign? The negative sign is thrown in there um, to take care of the conservation of energy. So for example, suppose we have a conductor loop like this, there's no current in it initially, and suppose the magnetic field runs into the board, and I can represent that with crosshairs. Okay, so this is the B field. Again, there's no induced voltage, no induced current, unless something changes. So let's say that the B field changes. How could that happen? Well, it could happen if the B field strengthens or weakens. So let's say it weakens. So if the B field gets weaker, say something like this, 
And as it's getting weaker, there'll be an induced current in this loop. But which way will the induced current be directed? Well, the negative sign reminds us of the conservation of energy. It turns out that the induced voltage and thus the induced current will always be in such a way as so as to oppose the very thing that caused the induced voltage and induced current in the first place. So since the magnetic field is disappearing, we would want to get an, an induced current going around the loop in a clockwise fashion. Okay, now remember, according to the second right-hand rule from the last unit, if the current does that, you're going to get a field set up into the loop, which is in bringing back the very field that's disappearing that's causing the induced current in the first place. Okay, let's look at another example. Suppose the B field is increasing in strength. So it's going to this. Well, as the field is increasing in strength, right, since that's a change in the magnetic field, strength, there will be an induced voltage and thus an induced current in the loop. But this time, won't it be directed the opposite way to oppose this increasing field? Okay, so the current in this case will be going in a counterclockwise manner using the second right hand rule. You see that my fingers come out of the loop. The field that the induced current is setting up comes out of the loop, which is opposing right, the strengthening field, which is directed into the board. Okay, this is known, this principle, okay, which is really just conservation of energy, known as Lenz's Law. Okay, now there is a, another way to predict the direction of the induced current. To do this, we'll go back to the previous unit, to the first right-hand rule. Before there's an induced current, imagine a positive charge and isn't this positive charge moving upward through this field directed into the board? There's also one up here we can imagine. If we point our thumb in the direction of the moving positive charge and these fingers in the direction of the field, it cuts through. The palm of our hand points to the left, so there's an induced current to the left, which means it wants to set up a current in a clockwise manner. But up here you'll notice it's just the opposite. But isn't the force that's pushing the positive charge to the left up here and the force that's pushing the positive charge to the left down here different? In fact, up here it's less force because there's less field that's, uh, that's cutting through than down here. So this wins. And overall, we get a clockwise current. Now that we know that the current is going clockwise, let's see if there's some opposition to that. Okay, and remember Lenz's law from this present unit. Okay, so we have a current going this way. Point these fingers in the direction of the field that the current is cutting through. Okay, which is into the board, and you notice the palm of my hand points downward. Up here, okay, you point your thumb in the direction of the current, which is clockwise. These fingers in the direction of the field that's cutting through, palm of the hand points up. But isn't this force upward less than this force downward? So overall, we have a downward magnetic force, which is opposing the motion upward, which is causing an induced current due to its interaction with the changing magnetic field. A little tricky, but I just showed you two ways of predicting the direction of the induced current, and we also saw that the direction that results um, does lead to an opposition to the very thing that's causing the induced current in the first place, and that's the changing magnetic field.